Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and uh, this talk is going to be on CT of the kidney, some of the basic principles, techniques, and clinical applications. Again, in one talk on the kidneys, it's hard to cover everything, but you'll see in this series we're going to have several talks on the kidneys. Now, when we speak about malignancies, we talk about a number of different tumors, and the one that I'm going to focus on today is going to be on renal cell carcinoma and transitional cell carcinoma. Now, when you look at some of the magic numbers, 58,000 plus Americans will be diagnosed with renal cancer this year, and an estimated 13,000 plus patients will die. Worldwide, the deaths are over 100,000. Over 40,000 of these cases and 12,000 deaths will be due to renal cell carcinoma. When you look at some of the demographics, typically the patients are over age 55, and it occurs more commonly in men. 92% plus cases are clear cell renal cell carcinoma, and about 8% are papillary renal cell carcinomas. When you look at some of the demographics and risk factors more common in men, smoking, obesity, high blood pressure are considered risk factors, so is long-term dialysis. Patients with unusual syndromes like von Hippel-Lindau get renal cell carcinomas at increased rate, but also they get it much earlier. They get multiple renal cells when they're in their 20s, so that's a very unusual syndrome. And also certain exposures, uh, phenacetine containing analgesis are one of the things people talk about. Now, when you talk about clinical presentation, we always think and talk about carcinoma with hematuria, but you can see from a presentation perspective, only about 40% of patients present with hematuria. 40% present with flank pain, palpable mass, weight loss, fever, hypercalcemia. You can see the lower things, palpable mass, weight loss, that tends to mean the patient has metastatic disease. Now the good news is, as we'll talk about, the majority of patients these days with renal cell carcinoma are picked up by serendipity. We pick up an incidental mass because we're scanning the patient for abdominal pain, trauma, or many other reasons, appendicitis. What's nice about this, of course, is the earlier you pick up a renal cell, the more likely it is to be resectable. And we'll speak about that in detail later. Now, I mentioned the most common cause of renal cell, the most common symptom for renal cell is hematuria, but it's important to remember that hematuria can be due to many other causes, whether it's vascular, glomerular, uropathelial, or just a range of miscellaneous causes. And this becomes very important. We also need to talk about hematuria as microscopic versus macroscopic hematuria. Microscopic hematuria is far more common and when you look at the numbers, microscopic hematuria is rarely associated with neoplasms. Macroscopic hematuria is commonly associated. So some magic numbers. In patients with microscopic hematuria, neoplasm is uncommon. And in the largest study, upper urinary tract, TCC, was found in only 0.2% of cases, renal cell in 1%, and bladder cancer in under 4%, and those are typically older population patients with bladder cancer. However, with macroscopic hematuria, the risk for malignancy is high and can be found in up to 28% of cases, and even 10% of patients younger than age 40 with macroscopic hematuria can have a renal cell cancer. Now, the whole area of renal cancer, the whole management and treatment has changed over the last decade. Remember, in the past, the only way of treating renal cell was doing a nephrectomy. And so whether you had a small mass or a big mass, you got a classic nephrectomy. Now, classic nephrectomies do occur, but partial nephrectomies or nephron sparing surgery is indeed becoming much more common. We also see many patients with smaller lesions getting ablation, whether it's RF ablation, or it's microwave ablation. And then we talk about other things from chemotherapy, some new chemotherapy in patients with metastatic disease, and immunotherapy, as well as vaccine therapy. Now, even in terms of partial nephrectomy, we are changing who can get a partial nephrectomy. Initially, it had to be that the tumor was 4 cm or less, but now 7 cm is the usual cutoff. And Partial nephrectomy can be done in T2 tumors over 7 cm in select cases when the patient has poor renal function and the need is to save the kidney. Location of tumor is critical in selecting patients for partial nephrectomy, and CT has become a very important part in really allowing us to decide whether or not a patient can get a partial nephrectomy based on location of the tumor and its relationship to vessels, renal hilum, and the like.
When we read a CT scan, we're really trying to answer some key questions. What's the size of the primary tumor? Is there vascular invasion, particularly venous invasion? Is there adjacent organ invasion? Are there nodes involved? Are there distal metastases, be it lung, liver, or bone? So there are many things we look at, but let's go back a little bit of a step. Let's talk about the challenges we face. One is optimizing lesion detection. Well, one of the things we'll speak about is that we've gotten so much better in lesion detection. Almost every patient over age 50 has a small renal lesion. We haven't done as well in lesion classification, okay? We see many small lesions and people report tiny lesion in the kidney, too small to classify further. What does that mean? Are you worrying about a cancer or is it just a small cyst? So again, detection gets better and better with our new scanners. Classification hasn't quite kept up with that, and we'll speak about that. And then, of course, one of the challenges is providing information to the referring physician. Urologists want to see things beyond the axial plane, and so multiplanar and 3D become very important. Now, I mentioned the part about the fact that two-thirds or so of lesions are picked up by serendipity. And you can see this article by Dyer made the point a couple years ago, as the size of these incidentally discovered lesions decreases, the proportion of benign lesions increases. However, while great strides have been made in lesion detection, characterization has lagged. And you can see numbers. This was an article going back some years from the uh, Cleveland Clinic that a quarter of lesions resected that was smaller than 3 cm were indeed benign. And so it's important to recognize the smaller the lesions you look at, the more they're going to be benign. This article by Stathofsky, 30% of tumors under 2 cm in diameter and 20% of those greater than 4 cm in diameter were actually benign lesions. And a benign lesion could be a complex cyst. It could be a oncocytoma potentially, I guess. It could be a lipid poor myelolipoma or a lipid containing angiomyelipoma. So again, with small renal tumors, a differential diagnosis, and yes, we're always thinking about renal cell, but it's important to remember that not every lesion is going to be a renal cell carcinoma. The American College of Radiology is trying to deal with these incidental findings. This article on the, by Berlin published a couple years ago, in general, large, over 3 cm renal masses are likely malignant. Similarly, the smaller a mass, the more likely it is benign. In addition, a small renal cell is more likely to be low-grade and indolent behaving than a larger one. Therefore, we've suggested that solid masses under 1 cm be observed. And so this observing means just simply getting follow-up CTs. Dr. Olive at Hopkins is following a number of older patients with lesions under 2 cm to see if it's worthwhile removing them. Remember, many of these small tumors are indolent tumors, they're not growing. Perhaps the best thing is to do nothing. In patients with additional comorbidities, maybe less is indeed more. Observation, this article by Berlin says, may be considered for solid renal masses of any size in a patient with limited life expectancy or comorbidities. So again, we're trying to understand how we need to manage patients. Removing a mass is not always going to be the best strategy. Now, in CT of the kidneys, protocol, like everything we speak about, becomes critical in our accuracy. And in the kidney, there are decisions, decisions, decisions. Contrast injection protocol, volume of contrast, injection rate, what's the collimation that we use? What phases do we get? Well, if we did not have an issue with radiation dose, I would get four phases on everybody. But we want to minimize the dose, and so it's very important to minimize the phases. You need to do enough phases to get the right answer, but no more than that. So how do we choose that? And then the importance of post-processing, which I'll discuss. In this article by uh, Pam Johnson, talking about some of the pitfalls, one of the biggest pitfalls really revolves around the technique we use. With the goal of refining performance, we show the uh, specific findings that are unique and where the errors and pitfalls occur. So maybe one way of thinking about errors and pitfalls is to look at the various phases, make the point that there's no one perfect phase, and every phase has certain advantages and certain disadvantages, and it's the use of several phases together that really gives us the best answer. So let's look at each phase carefully. Non-contrast. Now, I will say for many things these days, we don't do non-contrast CT and contrast CT. 
Liver, people used to do non-contrast routine liver imaging. We don't, we don't do that any longer. You don't need to. But in the kidneys, non-contrast can be helpful. Several things. Non-contrast tells you the density of a lesion. If you see a homogeneous renal mass and it measures over 70 Hounsfield units on non-contrast CT, there's a 99.9% .9 chance it's simply a high attenuation renal cyst and it's not a tumor. So if you look at this lesion in the left kidney and you say, aha, could this be a renal cell? Theoretically, yes, but you measure it at 73, it's well defined, that's a high density renal cyst, it's a leave alone lesion. Now I know most of us will give IV contrast, and you'll see when you give IV contrast, whether it's arterial phase or venous phase or delayed phase, a high density renal cyst does not change its attenuation. And an example is this case. Look at the left kidney, that anterior mass. It measures almost 70 Hounsfield units, 67 plus or minus 13 on the non-contrast CT. And when you narrow the window, it stands out even better. Well, you give IV contrast. Now you look at the lesion, and it's 68. It's not enhancing. But one would have to admit, and this is the value of non-contrast, if I didn't have the non-contrast and I only had this phase, I would say there's a solid mass in the left kidney. It measures 68 Hounsfield units. It's a papillary renal cell carcinoma. Okay? With the non-contrast, I'd say, wait a second. And then sure enough, you have delayed phase imaging, and it's 69. It does not change attenuation. And so now you're looking at a lesion that if you only had delayed phase, you would say it's a renal cell carcinoma. But now with the non-contrast, arterial and delayed, I see a lesion that I could have called on the non-contrast probably benign, but it doesn't change over the enhancement phases, and that's classic for a high-density renal cyst. It's a leave-alone lesion. If you had only the other phases, you, want, you would have probably resected that lesion. Another example here. This lesion looks worrisome. It looks solid, but it measures 15 Hounsfield units in the left kidney. Now, one of the things you'll see, under 20 is most likely benign, but you have to admit, it doesn't look like a simple cyst. It measures 15 and just looks wrong. Well, you give contrast, and there it is, arterial phase. When you measure it, it measures 18 or 17. And then you go a little bit later on venous phase and it's 15. And then you go on excretory phase and it's 18. So this lesion did not enhance. It stayed the same within two or three Hounsfield units. That's classic for a high density renal cyst. I have to admit, if you just visually look at the lesion, you're thinking tumor. So it's very important to measure tumors. I think one of the mistakes people make at times is assuming something is benign and it's really malignant, or assuming something's malignant and it's really benign. So looking at specific numbers, a cursor about 1 cm in size works very nicely. Now, there have been several articles that have looked at this more carefully and tried to say, well, these numbers, how important are the numbers? And the good article by O'Connor. So what they looked at is they looked at the density, and what he found was and very importantly, mass is over a centimeter. So under a centimeter, you have too much partial averaging. So it's really hard uh, to make rules. So assume a centimeter or better. And remember, under 1 cm, the ACR says simply just follow it. So mass is 1 cm or larger, containing fat with attenuation less than 20 or more than 70. Okay, non-contrast. Under 20, over 70 are benign if they did not have thickened walls or septations. Uh, mural nodules, or calcifications. 70 to 20, anything between 20 and 70 was considered indeterminate on non-contrast. And those were the ones you worried about. So it's interesting, kind of matches that first article, 70 or greater, 99% benign. Well, this one's saying under 20, over 70, don't worry about it. Then there's another article came along with Pooler. He kind of did the reverse. He said, let me look at all my renal cells and let's see what they were on non-contrast CT. And when you look backwards, indeterminate lesions on non-contrast CT measured within the 20 to 70 Hounsfield unit danger range, where lesions that were outside these range were benign. So again, now we have additional information from the non-contrast CT. Not only can we have a baseline, but on that baseline, we can really look and predict what we're going to see. In this article by Pooler, the average attenuation was 40, 39.7 in patients who had malignancies, okay? That's a very good point. When you're 
under 20 or over 70 is going to be benign. So again, very, very good look. And so the non-contrast can be very important to us. Now, the reason this becomes very important is sometimes patients only have non-contrast CT. It's not uncommon in the ER setting. Maybe it's a stone study. Maybe it's just a rule out anything and the ER doc was driving you crazy and they said no contrast. But what you recognize in this scenario, if something measures 10, and it's 3 cm or measures 80 and it's 3 cm, you probably can leave the lesion alone and not do anything else. But if it measures 37 non-contrast, you better tell them that they need to do a contrast enhanced scan because it's highly suspicious that this may be a renal cell carcinoma. Now in saying that, when you look at lesions and it looks like this, look at the mass in the left kidney, you see calcifications that look mottled. That's a stippled calcification. To me, that looks bad. You look at the lesion, it measured about 40 Hounsfield units, it's solid. That's not going to be a benign lesion. You give IV contrast, <clears throat> there's some vascularity present, but it's not very vascular, but you can see it is enhancing. It's a solid mass. Lack of vascularity makes you think about a papillary renal cell carcinoma rather than a clear cell. And as you look at the lesion from the coronal display in 3D, early to late phase imaging, you can see the lesion begins to enhance a little bit more in later phase imaging. I have found that with papillary renal cell carcinomas, you may see increased enhancement later on in the study. When you're dealing with clear cell, the arterial phase is typically the brightest phase. And with clear cell, as we'll discuss, we typically think about 100, 110 Hounsfield units and better. Now, when we give IV contrast, a good way of thinking about the kidney is we're doing functional imaging. And depending how soon you scan, the kidney will look differently. And so typically, we like to put things into three phases. If I inject contrast, and I'm telling you I'm injecting 5 cc's of between 100 and 120 cc's of Omni, or Visipake, 350 or 320. If we scan in about 30 seconds, we consider that arterial or cortical medullary phase. 60 seconds to 70 seconds, some people go to 90 seconds, nephrographic phase, and excretory phase, we like to say four to five minutes. Some people wait longer. I'll tell you that I like four to five minutes because it creates less artifact. So let's look at these phases specifically. Cortical medullary phase. 20 to 45 seconds after injection, I like 30 seconds. It's the phase when the cortex is maximally enhanced and the medulla is minimally enhanced. So the interface between cortex and medulla is about 90 to 100 Hounsfield units. It's a wonderful phase for looking at arterial structures. It's a wonderful phase for looking at preoperative planning because you have a vascular map. Tumor vascularity allows me to say clear cell, oncocytoma, renal cell, papillary. You can see changes in perfusion. Tumor detection may only be in arterial phase imaging or cortical medullary phase imaging for some select tumors. Also, sometimes I can appreciate it's an oncocytoma because of the way it enhances in the early phase. So it's a very, very important phase to me. When you do partial nephrectomies, it creates the vascular mapping we need. So in my mind, I always need early phase imaging. Some people have not been very big on early phase imaging. They say, well, you know, you, it's just not that good for picking up. And it used to be that it would give you pseudo lesions. But with current state-of-the-art imaging, it's not an issue. And to me, it's super critical to get these vascular maps. You see here with volume rendering in MIP. And then when you have a tumor, I can see the AV shunting. This is a classic clear cell renal cell carcinoma because of the neovascularity, the impressive vascularity, and the shunting. So whether you're using volume rendering or MIP, it's very easy to be very specific. So again, arterial phase really helps me define the lesion. I can tell the difference between clear cell, which this is, and a different tumor. The other thing is, although we like to think about venous phase as the best phase for renal vein and IVC involvement, in tumors that are vascular, you can see the extension of the tumor into the renal vein, IVC, and into right atrium at times because of the neovascularity. And here's a wonderful example of a right renal mass. And look at the extension of tumor into the renal vein. Look at the neovascularity. You know it's a clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And you can see it's growing up. It's not thrombus in the IVC. It's tumor in the IVC, which is growing up into the right atrium. Very, very important. Now, this idea about being able to tell what tumors are becomes indeed very, very important to us.
Uh, a couple of articles have really made the point very nicely. There's an article by Rupert made the point that clear cell renal cell carcinoma, the average attenuation value was 152, while papillary was only going to be 62. That's quite a spread. And when you use those numbers, his accuracy was 95 plus percent with a sensitivity of nearly 98 percent. And in fact, when you use a cutoff of 100, the specificity was over 92 percent over 100 being clear cell, under 100 being papillary. Now, it's not always going to be perfect. Zhang made the point 90% of clear cells are hypervascular, but not every clear cell. And similarly, 75% of papillary are hypovascular, and 90% of all papillary demonstrate homogeneous or peripheral enhancement pattern. So occasionally, clear cells will be hypovascular, and occasionally, papillaries will be hypervascular, but in better than 90% of the cases, you can be very specific. Now, this idea about looking at the vascularity is something that becomes more important. Certain articles, like this article by Salk, make the point that we can look and predict genetic karyotypes by looking at the vascularity. Genetic makeup of clear cell renal cells affects their imaging features. Imaging features in multi-phase CT allow you to create information that affects prognosis and may predict response to molecular targeted therapies. So for example, clear cell with loss of Y chromosome enhanced more than those without the anomaly in male patients in early phase imaging. And clear cell with trisomy 7 enhanced less than those with diasomy 7 or renal cells with trisomy 5 enhanced more than those with diasomy 5 during the excretory phase. So you can see that perhaps the genetic impact and the correlation between CT and the genetics of the tumor indeed becomes very important. This article by Chanarana, ability to non-invasively discriminate clear cell from papillary with analysis of whole lesion enhancement, Histograms can potentially affect patient management as those two subtypes have different prognosis and respond differently to available chemotherapy. So again, there's lots of interest in being able to create specific maps that look at these tumors. And again, this whole idea about histogram analysis, this idea about texture mapping becomes very, very important, that we can predict how patients will respond to chemotherapies. This article by Rahman, uh, we looked at 20 clear cells, 20 papillary, 20 oncocytomas, and then calculated how the lesions look differently with a mathematical analysis. Does mathematical analysis correctly characterize oncocytomas in 89% of cases, renal cell, clear cells in 91%, cysts in 100%, and papillary in 100%. So you can see that simply by analyzing, which means drawing a circle within the mass, allows us to be much more specific. And I think this is really a potential potential important zone as new chemotherapy comes around. And also in terms of partial nephrectomies, you're more likely to be aggressive on a partial nephrectomy for a papillary, which has a low chance of recurring, than you are for an aggressive clear cell renal cell carcinomas. Now, when you look at papillaries, the reason it's so important to recognize them, they're small typically, though not always. They're usually low-grade tumors. They're usually hypovascular. They can be multifocal and they have a better prognosis, and they're really ideal for nephron-sparing surgery. A couple of articles by Hertz way back when made this point that these are low-grade tumors, and the enhancement pattern is critical. Now, papillaries are also one of the tumors that's very easy to miss on non-contrast CT. Look at the image on your left. They're often the same density as normal kidney. They're not large. They may cause subtle bumps. In this case, a non-contrast, you really don't see much of anything. You would miss the lesion, which is kind of obvious on the patient's arterial phase and obvious on arterial phase when you look at the inferior part of the kidney. But again, small lesion, well-defined, perfect candidate for a partial nephrectomy. I also like to make the point with papillaries because they're so well-defined and small. If you're just scanning through a data set and you're not looking for a renal cell, you look at this and you quickly say, well-defined, low density, it's just a cyst. And you're going to be wrong. It's a papillary renal cell. So it's very important to be careful. And the ability to visualize these lesions, look at the non-contrast, look at the excretory phase,
easy to blow by them in those two phases. The middle phase is pretty easy to recognize. Now, one other tumor that I think we've been able to recognize in select cases is chromophobe renal cell carcinomas. It makes up around 5% of renal cells. The majority of patients are males in their 60s. Often it's an incidental finding. Chromophobes are important because it, you would, if you knew it was a chromophobe, you would really do a partial nephrectomy because these are rare to metastasize. The lesions are typically hypovascular but they're larger than your typical papillary. They sort of fall in between clear cell and papillary, though there's considerable overlap. In this article, we found the maximum diameter was a bit over five centimeters, 46% enhanced homogeneously, 85% of the lesions were either completely solid or mostly solid, 14% showed calcification, maximum mean attenuation was 88, 84 on venous and 60 on delayed. So you can see that it's kind of closer to the papillary than it is the clear cell. Chromophobes are most likely to present as a well-circumscribed homogeneous mass, often with a central scar. So again, it's something to think about. So I'll show you a few examples, and the reason is important. In this case, you'd say, okay, big lesion, pushing in the pelvis, perhaps I should do a nephrectomy. But if you're thinking about a chromophobe, look with enhancement. You see it's not very vascular. It looks more like papillary. And papillary, you might say, okay, I'm going to do a partial. And then you look at it, it's bigger than most papillaries, but it's so well defined. And when you look at it, there's a little bit of central necrosis on the delayed phase imaging. Very well defined on the 3D mapping. And I think it's worthwhile at least to suggest the possibility of chromophobe. This may impact how the surgeon manages the patient. Or in this example, another case, it looks very similar to the last case, smaller. But there it is, same density as the rest of the kidney, almost, on the axials and on the sagittals. Then you give IV contrast, it enhances, but it's not vascular like a clear cell, so it's not a clear cell. Could it be a papillary? I guess it can. It comes very central or comes sort of central where you might worry about doing a partial nephrectomy, but it was so well defined, so indolent looking, we suggested that could this be a chromophobe, the lesion was biopsied, and the patient had a partial nephrectomy. It was an aggressive partial, but if they would have thought this was a clear cell, they would have done a total nephrectomy. Now, in terms of functional imaging, venous phase, if you ask me what phase is not necessary for picking up tumors, detecting tumors, I will tell you that if I have cortical medullary phase and excretory phase, I'll see every tumor. Sometimes the tumor shows better in the venous phase, but I'll tell you I typically will have seen it in other phases. Now, where this phase is best is looking for venous involvement. Sometimes on arterial phase imaging, I showed you a nice example of neovascularity with venous involvement. Sometimes the venous involvement is not that impressive, and sometimes it's hard to tell what's flow-related versus what's really tumor, and that's really where venous phase is ideal. This article by Guzzo from Hopkins a couple years ago showed that CT with venous phase imaging and 3D mapping was always able to show you venous involvement. It was basically 100% accurate. The only time it missed anything was small venous involvement within the kidney, which was not going to be of clinical importance. Now, if you look at some examples, here's a nice case. This is the early phase imaging, and you can see a mass in the right kidney, and it looks like potentially venous involvement. But is this flow-related, or is it really venous involvement? Well. Realistically, you know it's venous involvement because you can see a transition in the mid uh, IVC in the liver. You can see it's expanded, there's low density, maybe some vascularity. So I would say even on the arterial phase, which shows a vascular renal cell and tumor extension into the renal vein and IVC, I would have no problem. But I would admit that if you had the venous phase, the tumor is probably shown a bit better. Some of the vascularity washes out. You can see its extension into the mid-IVC intrahepatically, but not into the right atrium, which becomes important. Or in this example, a relatively hypovascular mass, what about IVC involvement? Here it is on the coronal views, arterial phase. The IVC looks large. Is it involved? I think you, th you know it is, but how extensive is it? One would have to admit venous phase involvement is easier to see on venous phase imaging. You see the large renal vein, you see the large IVC, and you see tumor going into the patient's right atrium. Very nicely seen at that example.
And here it is on the axial report. Going back one slide to make the point, coronal is spectacular not only for detecting IVC and renal vein involvement, but for defining extent. Sometimes on the axials alone, there's too much partial averaging. Again, volume displays work very nicely for the referring physician. Now, one of the things I'm always concerned about with renal imaging is missing renal masses. Because of the various protocols and timing, I think the kidneys give you one of the greatest areas of potential error. And remember, these are important lesions because we can cure patients with renal cell carcinoma. So if I think about where the biggest mistakes are, it's the wrong phase of acquisition. And I showed you and made some points about that a few moments ago, and we'll come back to it. We also talk about poor display formatting. If you only look at axial imaging, you may miss a lot of lesions, as I showed you, and also extent of lesions with 3D imaging becomes important. And then there's post-processing. Now, let me show you some examples and some pitfalls. In terms of the wrong phase of imaging, remember I told you I really like early phase imaging, but I will be the first to admit that sometimes you can miss things in arterial phase imaging. So I will say to you, when you use early phase or arterial phase imaging at 30 seconds, you need to have excretory phase imaging with it. This alone is not enough. And here's a good example. If you have a small renal lesion that's vascular, but it's intrarenal and doesn't distort the outline, it's very easy to miss. So if you look at this case, for example, look at the patient's left kidney. It looks pretty good, the outline, and maybe you don't see anything, but let me put a circle there, and now you see something, or maybe you still don't see something. Am I imagining something there? Well, there's the coronal of the left kidney, and coronals usually help me, but I'm still not seeing anything definitive. And there's my 3D, and I'm still kind of not doing well. But look what happens when I do the delayed phase imaging. Look how obvious that two centimeter renal cell carcinoma is. So again, sometimes small vascular lesions are easy to miss. Or in this next case, Again, look at the left kidney, and I'll give you the upper two halves, upper two thirds of the kidney. Look at the lower pole. Is this a lesion? I don't know. Probably would walk by it, but look at delayed phase imaging. You can see that's a small vascular renal cell carcinoma that washes out, that's so obvious. Or this next example, look at the lower pole of the right kidney. This was not for hematuria, it was abdominal pain. And when you look at the lower pole of the right kidney, it just doesn't look impressive. But look what happens on excretory phase imaging. There's the most subtle change on the early phase in the cortical medullary interface, which becomes super obvious on delayed phase imaging. So that becomes very important. Phase is everything. Only one phase will give you significant error. Now, if you say to me, perhaps, let me only get delayed phase imaging, I will then tell you that some vascular renal cells are missed when you only have delayed phase imaging. So there's no one perfect phase, but give me early and late together and I'm very, very happy. Now, I also mentioned about missing lesions with display format, and I think if you only look at the axials, it's easy to miss things. And here's just a simple example, which I really like. This was read as negative. Upper pole right kidney. You see, it looks like the upper pole of the right kidney. You're not very impressed, but look what happens on a coronal view. You see, the upper pole is really an upper pole mass. It's a classic renal cell carcinoma. It's obvious from across the room, but if you only look at the axials, it seems to blend with the rest of the kidney. So indeed, you need to be very careful. At a minimum, you need to look at coronals and sagittals, particularly coronals. If not, you're going to miss a number of different lesions. And this is just a very nice example. Now, delayed phase imaging I spoke about as critical for picking up small vascular renal cells. It's not a optional phase, it's a mandatory phase that we need to have. When you look at things in delayed phase imaging, you're really talking about CT urography. And CT urography, there were many different ways of doing it, multi-phase, single injection, dual injection, prone, supine, Lasix, no Lasix, many things were done. In the era of decreased radiation dose, people went from nine phases down to one phase. And we do at Hopkins, since we give patients 1,000 cc's of water prior to the study, and we have the patient not void before the study, we get good bladder distension, and we get good excretion of contrast into the ureter.
Well, typically injecting 100 to 120 cc's of Omni 350, again, that 5 cc injection rate is ideal. And I typically like four to five minutes as my optimal technique. I save eight minutes when the patient has known obstruction or I see known obstruction while we're looking at a UPJ. And I'll show you why in a moment. CT urography requires axials, coronals, and sagittals. And by giving this hydration, this 1,000 cc's, you can see this article by Dr. Kawamoto that in about 94 plus percent of cases, we had good visualization. If the patient is not hydrated and excreting contrast, then you're not going to be able to get a good look at the pelvis and ureters. 3D imaging works very nicely. You see the volume rendering here and here showing you the renal pelvis collecting system and proximal ureters. And you can play around with the data set and really look inside. We can see duplication of the collecting system. Now I will say, can I 100% of the time opacify the ureters that nicely? The answer is no. You know that from IVPs, there's often peristalsis. But I would say I'm able to opacify the ureters in most cases very nicely. And then I'm able to look at the ureters not opacified and be able to analyze it the way I analyze a loop of small bowel. Now, when we speak about the renal pelvis and collecting systems in ureters, we're typically talking about transitional cell carcinoma. The most common clinical presentation is hematuria. TCC make up less than 10% of renal cell carcinomas. The age range is about the same. There's certain things that are a bit unusual. These tumors are often multifocal, much more common male to female ratio, and you will often see multiple tumors of the upper and lower tracts. This multiplicity and recurrence is indeed very common. 40% of patients with upper tract TCC eventually develop bladder cancer. So when you're thinking about TCC, you really need to be looking everywhere. You see a lesion, don't become satisfied with the search. Look for other lesions, either contralateral kidney, ureter, or bladder. Remember with TCC, treatment is nephrectomy, removing of the ureter and a cuff of bladder, so we're much more aggressive. TCCs, certain things seem to be related, including heavy caffeine consumption. And there's a number of different appearances that allow you to make the diagnosis. Now, sometimes the appearances are subtle and are tricky. Single or multiple sessile filling defects that compress the sinus fat, pelvic hail seal irregularities with strictures, focal diffuse mural thickening, calocele amputation, and tumor-filled distended calices are the classic types of appearances. We talk about large TCCs, they're big challenges. They look more like renal cell carcinomas or even potentially lymphoma. TCCs are hypovascular, so they're often subtle. Look at this arterial phase imaging and look at the right kidney. There's some soft tissue centrally right there but boy, that's easy to miss because there's no perfusion change. And here it is again in the coronal. There's no changes in perfusion. But when you get delayed face imaging, now you look at the pelvis and collecting system. You can see it's irregular. You go to the coronal. Now you see the destruction of the renal pelvis on the right, destruction of calyces. And on 3D, particularly MIP, look how nicely destruction of the calyces is seen in the upper pole. Again, 3D NPR become critical. Or in this example, one would have to admit this should not have been read as negative. It was an outside study, read as negative. The left kidney, something's going on in the renal pelvis there. I think you should recognize that. Now, they read this as parapelvic cyst, but it's not really cyst. Something looks wrong. You go to the coronal, they would have made the right answer because the coronal, you see the dilated upper pole calyx with amputation more proximally. This is a classic transitional cell carcinoma. Again, coronals will often make it very easy to show the changes in the calyces, as in this case, beautifully shown, that destroyed calyx, the blown out calyx, the infiltration, all very nicely shown. Now, sometimes TCCs are more aggressive, right? In this case, there's something infiltrating the left kidney. Perhaps it's a TCC, but maybe it's a renal cell. And here you can see it's involving the renal vein. When I see renal vein, I'm always thinking about renal cell, but it's important to remember that transitional cell carcinomas can involve the renal vein. And when you look at this a little bit closely, it has that infiltrating process that really makes you think about transitional cell that nice infiltration which maintains the renal borders, that decreased enhancement, but you can see it has renal vein involvement. And I'm just showing you this in a number of different perspectives 
to really get a feel of how easy it is to either overlook the lesion or misdiagnose it. Again, very important. And when you go to coronals, you can see here very nicely the tumor infiltration, mid to upper pole. And when you look at the three Ds, the MIP imaging from the calyces, the upper pole calyces are gone. Indeed, a classic transitional cell. Again, the subtleness, here's one on the right kidney. You look at the renal pelvis, non-contrast, not impressed. You look with contrast, kind of looks funny. And see, it kind of looks thickened here. You see it there. And then you go to delayed phase. Now you see it better because there's something that's not filling in the kidney. And when you look carefully on the coronal, at first glance you say everything looks good, but then you ask, where's the lower pole calyx on the right? You see that hypodense zone right there? And then you look more carefully, and you see the destruction of the lower portion of the pelvis and the lower pole calyx, and there it is right there. So again, this very nice example of a transitional cell carcinoma and very nice use of multiplanar on 3D imaging. Now, when you look at the kidneys, we also need to look very carefully at the ureters. The ureters, if they're not obstructed, tend to be overlooked. We look at the left kidney non-contrast, the pelvis is full, the left ureter may be full. Here it is, arterial phase, you see thinning of the cortices, you see perfusion changes, and now you look at the coronal, and you look at the left kidney and you say, perhaps this is a UPJ. Maybe that's why the calyces are dilated. But then you look a bit more carefully, and the ureter is thickened, okay? Better seen on the axial. And now you get a few more images. And you can see at the pelvis is not the UPJ look, but we'll look further. And there it is on the coronal. You see the thickening of the uh, proximal left ureter? If you have a UPJ, you have a cutoff, but the ureter then has collapsed. It's not thickened. It's not irregular. This is a subtle lesion, but it's causing obstruction, and it was a transitional cell carcinoma. Now, this whole idea about looking at the ureters to me is very important. Now, I mentioned before you can't always get perfect opacification with contrast of the ureters. But so what? The way I look at it, and the reason I don't worry about waiting more than five minutes, when you're obstructed, you know from IVP days, you need to wait hours to get the pelvis and ureter opacified. On the other hand, an obstructed ureter, like obstructed bowel, is filled with fluid. It's not collapsed. We give, oral, we give lots of water. So look at the right renal pelvis and the ureter. You can see it's dilated. Now we look for where the transition point is, which is distally, and we can see very nicely the transition point. As I go to sagittals, you can see the soft tissue infiltration. That's a transitional cell carcinoma. Now, yes, you can see it in axial views if you looked very carefully. You see the ureter with water, then you see a solid component in the ureter. But one would have to admit it becomes much more obvious when you look at this image. And then you look at that transition point right there. And you look at it on the sagittal view as well. That was a so-called goblet sign. Very nice example of that goblet sign, but a very nice transition point. And that's a classic TCC of the ureter. Now, with TCC of the ureter, thickening is the most common finding. You may see abnormal enhancement. You may see dystrophic calcification. You may see stranding. And, of course, hydronephrosis and hydroureter. The ureteral tumors are most common in the distal ureter compared to mid and proximal ureter. Transitional cell carcinoma accounts for 90% of ureteral tumors with squamous cell about 10% and adenocarcinoma under 1%. Again, age 60 is very much in the same age range of renal cell carcinoma. As I mentioned in the good article by Shiva Rahman, it's a challenge to look at the ureters, okay? But again, the key is multiplanar on 3D imaging. It's looking at the full sequence of images, looking for some of the transitions. And again, it's subtle, and I'll just review the points I made. Accentuation of subtle strictures in sight of narrowing. You need to accentuate subtle abnormal enhancement patterns on 3D imaging. Better visualize the distal ureter with coronals and with 3D imaging. And again, lesions can be subtle and polypoid, but they often cause obstruction, and so they're easy to see if you're very careful. Look at this case, dilated right renal pelvis. There has to be a reason. You follow the ureter downward on non-contrast, it looks more solid. You see the transition point. With contrast, you now see the ureter has some increased enhancement. Now, you can be fooled at times with infection. The ureter can enhance, but you don't see transitions like this. Then you go to the next slide, and there's the soft tissue mass.
okay? So again, it's subtle, easily missed, but if you're very careful, you need to be very, very careful and analyze the images. Good article by Zoo when stratified by location, urethelial thickening was more predictive of tumor in the pelvic halo system than in the ureter. In contrast, filling defects were more predictive in the ureter. A couple other examples. Look at this patient, and again, this is where the 3D imaging works well. There's no hydronephrosis in the left kidney, and you look at the left renal pelvis and proximal ureter, even when you look quickly, you're not that impressed. But look at where I targeted. Look at that a bit more carefully. You want to say it's peristalsis, but look at it more carefully. It's irregular. It's subtle infiltration. There's a transitional cell carcinoma. Now, I mentioned enhancement is often increased at the site of transitional cell, but I also mentioned that at times with infection, ureters can be thickened and you can see enhancement, but then you see lots of stranding, and usually it's much more extensive than with a transitional cell, but again, you need to be careful. There is some overlap, so it may not always be perfect. Now, in terms of subtleties, I think it's amazing the things you can miss. With transitional cell, we often think about the fact that the ureter is dilated, but it doesn't have to be. Look at the ureter here. Look at the left side. And I'll take away the bone. And you look at the left ureter, you see it's like a crescent, but boy, that's subtle. Is there something there? Or is it just transition point? Well, look at that more carefully. I don't know, you could argue a bunch, but look at the coronal. There, it's an obvious tumor, okay? Very, very obvious tumor in the left ureter. No mistakes about it, right? Classic TCC, but again, there's no hydronephrosis. There it is on the 3D volume rendering. Beautiful example of a TCC. Look how easy it would be to miss that. It's a small lesion, about a centimeter or less, and there's no obstruction. And if you say, well, that case must have been the world's craziest case, look at this patient, hematuria, history of prostate cancer. I was taking the bone away to look at the prostate better. Look at the left ureter. I've widened the window. It's critical to widen the window because things often get very dense. And you look really hard. There is like a donut in the left ureter. That's subtle. Maybe it's my imagination. But there it is on the coronal view. Look how nicely you can see that lesion. And here it is again. There's the 3D, and there it is. Look at this case. Patient previously had the prostatectomy. There's a TCC in the ureter. Look how subtle it is. There's no obstruction. There's some peristalsis in both ureters, but look how easy it was to miss that lesion. Again, the importance of really looking at things very, very carefully. And this article, we made the point that proper diagnosis hinges not only on appropriate interpretation of the axial images, but the importance of using uh, 3D imaging. Uh, it's not just an ancillary tool, it's a primary tumor. It's critical to really analyzing these lesions. There's so much you're going to miss. Uh, this article by Mullen does make the point, um, again, how easy it is to miss transitional cell carcinomas. And patients with hematuria, repeat CT within three years is unlikely to show a urinary tract malignancy if the study is done correctly. So again, you need to be very careful. So concluding then, several conclusions. CT with CTA and 3D imaging is a study of choice for the detection and staging of renal tumors. Our accuracy of CT and lesion detection and characterization is highly dependent on scanning protocols. Remember, it's easy to pick up a small lesion. It becomes harder to classify, and it's something we need to spend a lot more time doing. At times, we'll simply need follow-up. At times, you can say MR or ultrasound, but again, with very small lesions, everyone has the same issue. There's lots of pitfalls, and I went through some of the pitfalls with you. And again, this lesion detection is only step one. Also, to make the point, not only with renal cells, but transitional cells, lesions can be very subtle. Anybody can pick up a 10 centimeter mass. It's the smaller lesions, picking them up early when the patient is resectable, when the patient is treatable, when the patient has wonderful outcomes, is really our job. And it's a challenge we face on a daily basis. And with that, I'll say thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the lecture, and see you soon.